No, thank you so much for joining us here at Grace Honolulu. Uh, my name is Sean Castro. I'm the youth director here with our church. You know, we're so thrilled to have you because we're continuing our series called Ordinary People. And every single week, we've been taking a look at not so famous people in the Bible that did extraordinary things for God. And as we consider uh, this message today, we're, uh, we're gonna uh, jump in in a bit, but I know that if you guys haven't got a chance to check out our messages, please go on our Grace Honolulu app, or you guys can go on to our YouTube uh, channel to be able to watch the previous messages, because I believe that you'll be cur- encouraged to hear about the lives of people being impacted by God, and how God used them to make an impact in the world that they were living in. So today, um, you know, about a week and a half ago, uh, my daughter approached me, and um, the latest trend with my daughter is that one of the first things that she says to me in the morning is, um, what are we going to do tomorrow? <laughs> and almost soon after, she would say, can we go in the kitchen? I want to draw. And um, so about a week and a half ago, my daughter made this request, so we went out into the, uh, into the living room area. So we have no carpet, so it's just hardwood floor. So we just sat on the ground, sat on the floor, and then my daughter was like, can you draw me Bluey? And um, if you're not familiar with Bluey, it's probably one of the best uh, kids' cartoons out there. Uh, they're from Australia, and my daughter loves them, uh, loves the, uh, the cartoon. So, and when we sat down, my daughter was like, oh, and by the way, can you draw the whole family? So it went from one character, Bluey, to the four family, the people in the family. And then, um, uh, so if anybody has drew anything, drawing one character is one thing, but to have all four characters in one drawing, that's a bit of a stretch and it's harder. So the perfectionist in me wanted to do the best because this is my daughter and this is her request for me. So I wanted to do the best drawing I could. And um, so this is the drawing that I had with my daughter. And... So that's the whole family. And soon after, my daughter said, hey, let's go color it. And um, by this time, this took way longer than I expected. And then I had work that I needed to get done also. So I was like, hey, Sophia, can we, let's, uh, how about instead of doing markers, let's do paint instead. Because I've seen my daughter use her markers and she's all any kind. She doesn't follow the lines or anything. And uh, the evil in my heart was saying, I did a lot of hard work in this drawing, (laughs) and I didn't want my daughter to mess it up. And unfortunately, I didn't want to mess up either. So so I was like, Sophia, how about this? I have to go into work, but how about um, I'll be able to help paint this with you or draw this with you later? And then uh, we kind of went back and forth. She wanted to do markers. I said painting. I went back and forth. Then we weren't going anywhere, so I said, okay, We'll, we'll, let's pick up this later. And then uh, the following day, same thing, she got up and she wanted, to, uh, she wanted to color the drawing. So there he was, and just when we were about to get started, um, she was okay with doing painting. So we got out the watercolor, and then after I sat down with her and I was like, okay, Sophia, I want you to follow me, okay? <laughs> so if you guys know my daughter, she is a wild lady, so she wants to do, <laughs> she wants to do whatever she wants. So the times when my wife and I tried to teach her, um, she would not listen to us. She would kind of do her own thing. So that's the kind of daughter I have. And uh, so, uh, so, but for the first time, she said, okay. So there she was. She was willing to, to have me teach her how to paint. So uh, she's had paint in her hands for a couple years now, and uh, she doesn't like to be taught. So this is the first time that she was okay. So there we were sitting on the ground, and I was like, okay, Sophia, okay, get some of that brown, and then we're gonna take that, we're gonna dip the brush into the water, and then we're gonna take that brush, dip it into the paint, and now we're gonna dip it back on the side of the palette so that you can take out the excess water so it doesn't (laughs) overflow. So, and then my daughter would follow me. For the first time ever, she would follow me, and then, yeah, so she would, like take the little tiny brush she had, she would go in the areas where I asked her to paint, and then I would paint and tell her, okay, this is the area I'm gonna paint to, and I was like, okay, we're gonna go in the lines, and then she followed me all throughout with every single color that we needed to do, and this is the painting that we did together. So for those of you who are online, you guys kinda see it, we'll show it up on screen too. So uh, after we were done, I was really, I was really stoked because I didn't think it was gonna come out this nice, to be honest. <laughs> but um, for me, this is just a small little picture. You see, the drawing itself was really cool, but there's something about 
an artwork that is monochromatic or just a line drawing, it doesn't have that, that, that oomph or that wow factor unless there is in color, unless it's in color. And sometimes when you think about our lives, our lives is a masterpiece written by God from a God who has a great plan and purpose for our lives. But isn't it true that sometimes when we look at our lives, we look at the brokenness, the hurt, the pain, the struggle, and we're like, man, I can't even see my life as a masterpiece. I don't even think how my life could be amounting to something. But when we think about God, God has a great plan and purpose for our lives. And when we don't have God in our lives or not seeking after him daily, our hearts become cold, our hearts become cynical, and we're like, you know what? My life is whatever, I'm just living my life now, I'm just doing my job, I'm doing my paycheck, I'm going to school, and life seems so mundane. I wanna encourage us all here that God has an amazing plan and purpose for our lives, and we want to be able to partner with God with what he's doing in our world today. And for me, I'm really thankful for this because I didn't add anything after our painting session, but I'm so thankful that uh, I partnered along with my daughter. I didn't take away the brush from her hand. I didn't <laughs> take the brush and like hold it on the top of the brush while she's holding the bottom part and I'm guiding everything. For me as a parent, I was with her. I was encouraging her. I was telling her where to go. And in the same way, God wants to do that with our lives and watch your lives be a masterpiece along the way. So that is just my intro. So <laughs> as we continue, we're not even in the word of God yet, but it's gonna get better. Okay, so, so when I think about this, what is challenging to me is like, um, for me doing this drawing, I needed a reference. So there's something about our world today where we equate uh, creativity to an artist or a crafty type of person. But for me, growing up, I loved drawing, but ever since I was a young kid, I always needed a reference. So for me, I had other friends who could draw off the top of their mind with no references, and for me, I thought that was creativity. So even though I could draw, I always need some kind of reference. So in my mind, I think that people say I'm an artist, but I don't have creativity. I'm not able to take things and draw things out of my own mind, but I need a reference. So for me, I wrestled with this understanding of creativity. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look in the scriptures in the Bible to help reframe our thinking, to actually see what God has and the potential that he has for us, and to break our mindset and mentality to understand that you are a creative person. So we're gonna take a look at Exodus 31. And here we look at the scripture and it says this. The Lord said to Moses, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahis, Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they make all that I have commanded you. Let's go ahead and let's pray as we consider God's word. God, we thank you, Lord, that your word is truth that anchors our soul, and you want to speak to us afresh today. I pray, Father, that you would uh, help us uh, understand who you call us to be, Lord Jesus, and how we can be able to make an impact on the world that you place us in. So we thank you, Lord, for your amazing love. Speak to us afresh today, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So as we consider Exodus 31, we need to know what is happening. So here we need to know that the people of Israel or the people of God, they were under slavery for 400 years by the Egyptians. And then God raised up Moses to lead the people of God, the over million people of God, out of slavery into the land that he called them to go. And with that, on that journey, God brings them to uh, Mount Sinai. And then God called Moses to go up to the mountain top to be with him. And then in Exodus chapter 20, God gives uh, Moses the Ten Commandments. And these Ten Commandments were meant to define the nation of Israel to set them apart from all other nations. Because we all know that every single nation has their laws, their way of life according to their ruler. And God himself, Yahweh, God is the ruler of Israel. So there is 
Moses atop the mountain, and then God is with him, and God gives Moses the Ten Commandments along with the laws about uh, building altars of worship to him, laws about restitution, laws about social justice, about Sabbath and festivals and all that stuff. And then he goes on to even share about building the tabernacle as well. And chapter after chapter, God gives a very clear uh, distinction of what materials to make, what size everything to be, with all the different articles that were to be in this tabernacle. And then we pick up the story in chapter 31, where the Lord said to Moses, see, in vision, I have called, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe and Judah. See, we need to understand that God calls us into relationship with him and he calls us to mission. So for Bezalel, God had called him uh, to do this very specific work and it says that Bezalel was from the tribe of Judah. So when we understand the people of Israel, we need to understand that the people of Israel were consistent of 12 tribes and every tribe was a descendant of Abraham and Bezalel was from the tribe of Judah. And what's interesting to note is Jesus Christ came from this very tribe of Judah as well. And in verse three, the Lord says, and I, the Lord, have filled Bezalel with the Holy Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, to be, basically be a stone worker, to be a wood carver, and all other crafts. So what we need to know about this is Bezalel was the very first person in the Bible that the Holy Spirit filled. So when we think about Moses, who led all of the people of God out of Egypt into the land, Moses, it was not written about him that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Abraham himself, the father of our faith, scripture did not say that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But Bezalel, this guy who just worked in, in crafts, he was a master artist. He did these amazing things. He had this tremendous skill. He was the first person in the Bible that was filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, we need to understand culturally back then when God was revealing himself to the people, back in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the new covenant or the New Testament of what is to come. So with the Old Testament, back in the day, the Holy Spirit would come upon ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And then after the people did great things, the Spirit of God left them. But here, we see that Bezalel was filled with the Holy Spirit. So what we need to know is that when God was bringing a point where he was gonna bring the Savior into the world, when God himself was gonna go into his creation, clothed himself with flesh, and, um, and was Jesus on the cross, uh, Jesus living a perfect life to the will of the Father, then eventually Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And Jesus, before he, uh, before he ascended into heaven, he said, I'm gonna leave with you an advocator, um, a helper, the Holy Spirit that is gonna be there with you and not just be with you, the Holy Spirit is gonna be in you. So you and I here today, when we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and receive him as our Lord and Savior, the very Holy Spirit of God regenerates in your life and that you become a new creation in him. And the desires that we once had for sin and all that dies and our heart, we become a new creation in God. We become born again and our desires is not to sin but our desires to honor God and to love him and to love others. So what is really amazing about this is that when we put our faith in Christ, we need to understand that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit resides in us. And for me, as an, as an artist, just trying to figure out life, and when it came to faith in God, I started reading the Bible, and Genesis chapter one, it helps us give a, a greater and bigger bird's eye view picture of what it means uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, in Genesis chapter one, if you guys remember, um, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you look at it from the very beginning, the Holy Spirit was active, moving, and and. Um, and part of creation and creating things. And here we find in Genesis 1.27 that says, so God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him male and female. So for me, when I, as I continued uh, in college and as I continued to, uh, to dive in on what it means to be an artist and what it means to be a, a, a man who, who loves God and wants to honor him with my life, 
when I began to read this scripture and began to study it, I began to understand that you and I here, every single person, whether you put your faith in Jesus or not, if you are a human being, you have tremendous worth in God's eyes and because you are made in the image of God. Nothing in all of creation that God made did not have the image of God marked upon their life. But you and I here, we need to know that we are made in the image of God. So that means that we have a, a creator and we have a, a likeness of God. So if God is a creator, God that created everything into motion and the Holy Spirit is residing in us when we have a faith in him, that means that we are in touch with the God of all creativity to be able to do the work that he calls us to do. So the point that I have here is the Holy Spirit gives us the creative ability to do the work that he's called you to do. The Holy Spirit gives us the creative ability to do the work that he's called us to do. You see, in our world today and in our lives, we oftentimes keep everything separate. This is my school life, this is my family life, this is my friends that I hang out with, and we keep everything separate. But here when we understand God and we understand our lives, our lives are entirely sacred because we're made in the image of God. And when we uh, put our faith in Christ, we not only have the um, creative capacity, but now you have the creative capacity as to which God intended humanity to be. So there's a slight distinction there. And for me, when I began to understand this as a, a, an artist uh, studying at UH, I began to understand and to reframe my thinking that yes, I'm not a creative person in which I can draw things off the top of my head, but I can be able to take whatever is made or whatever is on, online, like a picture, I can be able to have a concept, I can be able to take apart different um, like aspects of uh, a drawing or a painting or a picture, and I can be able to remake my own story to it. And then even before, I guess, um, uh, Photoshop was there, I would, use my, uh, I would use Microsoft Paint, I would use whatever materials I had, I would take whatever pictures I had, I would uh, try to set up my camera to do certain like uh, movements with my arms or legs or something so that I can be able to see uh, and visually get a reference. So for me, God had to reframe my thinking that yes, I am creative, but in a unique way. So we need to understand that when we understand God, that we are, created in his image, he gives you the potential to be creative. And it doesn't mean that you're gonna be holding a paintbrush or writing some amazing song or writing um, a chords for music. Maybe you might be called to do that, but maybe God has called you to be creative in different ways. And we're gonna be talking a little bit more of what that could look like for us. But God gives us a creative ability to do the work that he's called you to do. And then going into verse six, it says, and behold, I, the Lord, have appointed with him, speaking of Bezalel, Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, and I, the Lord, have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I, the Lord, have commanded you. And then in verses seven to verses 11, God gives specific things for Bezalel uh, to make. So as we consider this scripture here, we need to know that even though God gave the Holy Spirit and to be filled in Bezalel, God appointed Oholiab, and it says here, and other uh, able men ability to be able to do all that God had commanded him to do. So that tells us that Bezalel was not a one-man show. Even though Bezalel had the Holy Spirit in him, God still provided Oholiab and his other men to work alongside with him. So this helps us understand that the purpose and the calling that God has for you is so big that you cannot fulfill it by yourself. If you can be able to do it by yourself, it's all about you, yourself, and I, and all the things that you can do, and all of your strength, and all of your wisdom, and you can prop yourself up to be the most prideful person in the entire world to say, this is my entire empire, and I did this all by myself. But here, God provides Bezalel with others to help him. Would you be willing to allow people in your life to be able to, uh, to work alongside with you and to be a support? For some of us here, you know, we come from a very uh, a background where your family was like, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do and all this kind of stuff. And, but I want us to reframe our thinking and our understanding that the calling of God that he has over your life is so big that you need other people to work alongside with you. So who's your team? Who's your team? 
you know, I really appreciate my, my wife. She, uh, she was serving in our church and God called her to uh, remember uh, her childhood and how um, her family's very entrepreneurial and she ended up uh, having visions and she uh, stepped out in faith to do a business. And my wife is really amazing. She can be able to envision stuff. She can get people involved. She can get stuff done, execute her. And uh, she's relational too. But with that, if you're here today and you're an entrepreneur, you're somebody who is uh, wanting to, to do something big, and at times you're kind of wondering, man, should I go about it? Sometimes it can be so easily to talk ourselves out of starting something new that you haven't done before because we're looking at our world and we're just thinking, oh, economy's junk and all X, Y, Z. We can look at everything in the natural, but if God has placed something in your heart and birthed something in you, it will never go away, and God would always make a way for it to happen. So that never left uh, my wife, and she stepped out in faith, and she's been growing in it. And what I love about her is that she's building a team, and she's building other people up along with it. And I want to encourage us here today that we're not alone. You know, if God placed you as somebody who's an entrepreneur to start up a business, God has a team for you. If you are somebody who's in a, a working for a business, or you are working in an organization or on a sports team or in a club, you need to know that you're not alone and there's other people that is there with you and you can be able to collab with them. So God provides coworkers or collaborators with you in your workplace. So my point is we need to be a creative collaborator in your world. Who is somebody that you can collaborate with? Who is somebody that you can co-labor with? Who is somebody that you can collaborate with in our world? So as we consider this here, we go into Exodus chapter 35. So four chapters later, here we find Moses. And remember, the chapter I read to you, God told Moses, like, hey, I've called this guy Bezalel and Oholiab, and they're gonna do the work of the tabernacle. But now, four chapters later, Moses actually had to find Bezalel in the midst of all the people of God. And then after he found them, he gathered all of Israel, and he said this, then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, and knowledge, and craftsmanship. And he begins to say all of the good things that he does and the things that he does excellently. You see, Moses was doing something significant here. You see, Moses, even though he was the leader there of the people, um, Moses said, hey, this guy Bezalel, he's gonna build the tabernacle, and he publicly acknowledges Bezalel, Bezalel's leadership in doing this project and the competency that he has to be able to complete it. And the point that I have here is that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to empower you to be excellent in what you do. You see, for Bezalel, you know, sometimes you think like, you know, was a person gifted, was it naturally talented? You know, I really believe that God gives us gifts and talents and it's up to us to develop it. There's certain things that we do well compared to other things and as we continue to develop in that particular uh, gifting or talent, um, God begins to do something in us and sometimes when we become better at the craft or something that we're doing for work, it comes really natural to us and what usually happens to most of us is that we stop growing. You know, this past, uh, the first service today, we had Uncle Norman Fukumitsu. Um, he's one of the heroes of the faith uh, here at our church. He's been with us for several decades. He's 85 years old. Uh, many of the projects that we have done here at our church, he helped oversee it or help bring uh, creative insight into what to do. And at 85 years old, he's walking. Uh, he is sharp. He is able to figure out things. And as I was talking with him, he was just sharing with me the importance of being a learner. And he's a lifelong learner, and he was just saying, you know what, when I go into a project, um, he's just full of joy because he knows that this is an opportunity to do something, and it's gonna look different, so he finds joy in the difficulty of trying to figure out. So he enjoys asking the question, why? You know, why is it like this? You know, and for me, it's so encouraging because as someone as old as he is and as classic and vintage as he is as well, <laughs> I wanna be like him when I'm 85 years old. And so we're never too young or too old to be excellent in what you do. You see, the tendency is we get better at something and then we coast. You know, we are good at something, whether you're in whatever job you're in as a teacher, if you're a, a realtor, if you're doing... Uh, 
uh, working, folding clothes, whatever industry you're in, you know, there's things that you gotta do, and over time, in faith, hopefully you have some kind of rhythm where you don't have to think anymore and you just do it, but here it says that the Holy Spirit uh, uh, empowered uh, them to do the work, and I believe that with Bezalel, he was excellent in what he did, so much so that he was able to do the next thing, which is in verse 34, um, he says, and he, the Holy Spirit of God, has inspired Bezalel to teach both him and Oholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. He, uh, the Holy Spirit, has filled them, Bezalel and Oholiab, with skill to do every sort of work, to be an engraver, a designer, embroiderer, and even a weaver. So we need to know that the Holy Spirit inspired Bezalel and Oholiab to teach others to do the work. You know, for us here, you know, if you're working and you know the ins and outs of your job, it's so easy for us to be mindless and we can be in this place of I know it all and how powerful would it be if we were to look and to reframe at our work and to say, you know what, Holy Spirit, can you inspire me to teach others? You see, there's a tendency in our culture today when you have a couple years under your belt in your particular job, a profession that you're in, sometimes you're like, seeing the, the new guy or the newbie getting into work and they're like messing up, they're like not doing well and sometimes the pride in us is like, oh yeah, I was there. Yeah, good luck to that guy. He's gonna, he's gonna struggle for a bit but he'll get it. But it says here that the Holy Spirit inspired them to teach others. Are you inspired by the Holy Spirit for you to teach others what you're doing at work? You know, sometimes I know that in industries where you're starting a business and you're trying to figure out stuff, you begin to find vendors and all these different things. And then at times it's hard for you to say, because sometimes people might ask like, oh, where do you get your stuff from? And all that. And sometimes even as business owners, we keep things a secret um, and all that. And there's a secret sauce to what you're kind of doing. But here, I think what is so important and what's so powerful is that the Holy Spirit inspired Bezalel and Oholiab to be able to teach the other workers. So the twofold thing that I want to call us to do as a church ohana is to be teachable. You know, there's always going to be somebody who's smarter than you in that craft. For me as an artist, there's far more greater artists that are there, out there. But whatever you know, are you willing to be able to teach others? So as we take a look at the last scripture here in Exodus 40, so now we're looking at the very last chapter in the book of Exodus, and this scripture here gives us the why God gives us the ability to be creative. So let's listen in here in verse 33. And he, Moses, erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You see, for for us here being in Hawaii, one of the most isolated places on earth, sometimes it's hard for us to even wrap our minds around the tabernacle. And maybe you might have been a Christian for a long time. You might not even know how the tabernacle looks like. But as I did my research, there's actually a place in Israel where an organization made an actual life-size replica of what the tabernacle looked like. And for us, we need to know that the tabernacle was a very place where God wanted to dwell amongst his people. So that means that it, it housed the very presence of God amongst his people and it needed to be portable. So um, this is a video a montage that I put together. So this is what the tabernacle could have looked like according to the Bible in Exodus uh, and what uh, Bezalel and Oholiab and the team made. So let's watch this here. So... The tabernacle was about 75 feet wide and 150 feet long. Um, when you walk into uh, the tabernacle, there's a courtyard space, and then that's the place where the people of God who had sin in their life and they needed to bring in an animal uh, to sacrifice on behalf of their sin. So the people of God would come in and bring their animal, a perfect, uh, unblemished sacrifice, and then the priest would take the animal, sacrifice it in that space right there, and then they'll go to this basin here uh, to wash, and this is like a, a, a place of uh, representing God's judgment and also God's grace over the people, that when you walk into the tabernacle itself, you walk into it, and every single item that is in there was distinctly written by God to do. So whether it's this uh, lampstand here or the table, there's so much intricate details that God wanted to do because this was gonna be his dwelling place. 
And as you go further in, um, this is the altar of incense. As Pastor Randy was praying, the incense or the, the prayers of the, Lord, uh, of, our, of the people goes up to the Lord. And this is the example of the garments that were to be made for all of the priests. And every single detail of there represents something. And then now we go into the Holy of Holies, the most holiest place in all the tabernacle. And all it had was the Ark of the Covenant that had the very presence of God and also the Ten Commandments there. And only once a year, the high priest could walk in to the presence of God and to and on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, to be able to go in and to offer um, himself to the Lord on behalf of the people. I say all of this to say, even for me when I took a look at this here visually, I began to understand some things, and maybe you probably noticed it too. How many of you guys were kind of tripping out that it's not that fancy looking, right? <laughs> You know, I was thinking like tabernacle, God's doing all this stuff, and it's so detailed if you read it in Exodus. But when you look at it, I was like, oh, it's kind of unimpressive. <laughs> and um, when you think about it, isn't our lives kind of unimpressive too? <laughs> Sometimes when you look in the mirror, you're like, okay, so God wants to use me. And it's, it's jokingly, but that's our God. Like, God is able to do the, the, the most amazing things through the most, un, through the most unlikely people, like ourselves. Like for me, I'm not qualified to be up here to be preaching the word because I know that God did something powerful in my life to change me from a person who loved my sin so much to be able to love him and honor him with my life. And for us here, as we consider this here, and as we answer that question, why does God give us the ability to be creative? Through this scripture here, we need to know that God fills you with creativity so that you can prepare a place for him to dwell where you live, work, and play. You see, for Bezalel, he had this task to be able to build the tabernacle, and he did this work in order for God's presence to come, and that that place would be a place where people can come and to experience God. So when we think about our work, our work is not somewhere you just clock in and clock out, do your mindful task, and you dig out, you get a paycheck, and you say, yay, my life is fulfilled. (laughs) There's actually far more to it than that. God gives you creativity, and he gives you the opportunity to be placed in the workplace for your, uh, for your good, even though the management may be junk, maybe, no, maybe your coworkers seem a little bit uh, unfriendly, but God has you there at your workplace, in your family, in, your, in our marriages, in our children's for a purpose. So when we begin to see that God gives us creativity so that we can be usher in God's presence wherever we go, that changes everything. For me, when I came to faith in God as a college student, I wanted to be able to, to share, other, share other, uh, others about uh, Jesus Christ. And I remember I would have blocks of time uh, at the art building where I had time to be able to, to, to just have no class. So what I did was, I, I was like, you know what? Um, I I'm, I'm just want to be make, make, making myself available to talk to whoever. So I would just hang out in the art building in my, um, my off uh, one hour break, and then I would just, uh, sit down, draw, or have a conversation with somebody who's sitting beside me and just talk story with people and see how they're doing. So that was my way of being, allowing God to be part of my life as an artist and to be uh, used by him wherever he places me. So when I got hired at a place to fold clothes, I knew that God had me there not just to fold clothes and get a paycheck, but for me to be uh, connecting people to bring creative solutions there at my workplace. So, so what does that even look like for our lives practically? So uh, for me, uh, my wife and I were celebrating our ninth year of marriage in August. Yay, nine years! Uh, So nine years. And this is a spoiler alert for you guys who are single, wanting to get married. After years and years, sometimes marriage uh, relationships become a little bit um, familiar. And then the the, the joy and excitement and the creativity kind of dies down because God has you with the amazing person right now. And we can find ourselves, even in our marriages, to be like, oh, you know what? Yeah, we're we're together, we have kids, we're we're roommates, we do stuff together. Um, But what if we were to ask God, okay, God, is my marriage where you want it to be right now? Holy Spirit, is there anything you want me to do to bring creative solutions to my marriage? And here's a crazy, I give you props if you do this prayer. God, how good of a husband am I? or how good of a spouse am I to my... uh, So when we have those type of prayers before God, I believe that God is gonna meet you right where you are and he's gonna tell you exactly what you need to hear. And God wants to do this in relationship with him, right? 
So when we think about our marriages, if you're married today, how's the creativity within your marriage? Is it the same old, same old? Is date times uh, an unfamiliar thing nowadays? I wanna encourage you guys to, to have creative uh, opportunities to be able to have date times or just spend time with one another. And I wanna encourage you that, it's, it's, like for Ladenia and I, we made it a point to be able to have uh, dates uh, or a date, especially at least once during the week. But then when we had our, our daughter, Sophia, we began to get off track with that and we weren't as consistent but we wanted to make it work because the best gift that, I can, that we can give to our daughter is a stable marriage, a loving marriage, a marriage where the husband and wife actually talk, uh, a marriage where we're sleeping in the same bed and to be able to give uh, our daughter uh, a picture of what it looks like to, to have a marriage as God intends. So with that, we had to fight for our schedule. When we, we had to work through our schedule to say, okay, when can we make it work? And I wanna encourage you, those of us here who are married, to not let the, um, we, we know what it's like, right? When we're boyfriend, girlfriend, those times when we're not married, we did a lot of creative stuff. Like, oh yeah, let's go plan this date, and you have all these great ideas and creativity sparking all over the place. But after uh, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of marriage, you're, it's not as lively or vibrant. How powerful would it be for God, the Holy Spirit, to meet you right where you are and to give you some creative ideas to spark some life into our marriages? And children here. For my wife and I, we have Sophia, and um, she loves drawing and stuff. And we are guilty too at times when we have our daughter look online and have screen time and stuff. But we made it a point to where we're going to put filters on it and we're going to put time limits on it as well. So we encourage our daughter to do fun stuff or crafty stuff. So as much as it was irritating at first where she would take pens and stuff and draw all over the walls, when she would paint stuff and it goes all over the floor, and as much as I was an artist, but seeing all the mess there, it gives me so much stress. And, <laughs> but God was doing something in me where I needed to set up my daughter for success, and I wanted her to have tactile things where she can be creative with. So we put crayons in her hand, we put markers, we put paints, we gave her pencils, all that stuff. We gave her Legos. And even as I was preparing this message, uh, uh, my daughter was on her own, she just went to the table right in front of me and then she started taking out her Legos and she started making stuff and she was like, look daddy, look, look. And for me, it, it, it warms my heart because not only is she exercising her creativity, but she is um, getting, um, she's looking at stuff on screens and stuff and she's getting a bigger sense of the world that she lives in but she's also being creative in knowing how to do stuff. And my wife always uh, tells me that uh, our daughter, Sophia, has street smarts. And uh, so one of the things that, uh, just this past week, Ladenia took my daughter out to, um, to go out and pick flowers. Uh, Sophia likes flowers and stuff. So she went out, they were picking flowers, and Ladenia was telling me that, um, Sophia was like, where are we gonna put the flowers? And then Ladenia was like, oh, I forgot the container at, at home. And then Sophia was like, she took off her hat and she was like, oh, we can use this. So as small as it is, um, that's creativity at work, you know? So for us here, we need to set our, our children, our next generation up for success and give them the tactile tools to be able to learn creatively for themselves. For me, as a dad, um, I, there's a part of me that wants to take a hold of the paintbrush and take a hold of her hand to be able to draw stuff. And partly my daughter's thing is she doesn't, she doesn't want to, she doesn't want help, but I've been seeing changes in her where she wants to be led, she wants to be able to, to learn. So for us here, we need to be able to set up our children, their next generation up for success and to be able to help them. And um, as we consider family, um, I grew up in a family where my mom ran a care home, so we had five elderly people, always senior citizens, and I seen how my mom worked hard every single day, and, um, and we were really family to them. And my mom, she never took uh, a vacation, ever. Vacation was never in our vocabulary as a family. And, um, and one of the things when Ladini and I got married, we talked about vacations and how important it is. And for me and the, the recovering workaholic that I am, Ladenia is so good to always challenge me. Even on my vacation, sometimes I'm like, uh, there's stuff that I think I need to do. And then Ladenia's like, it's our vacation. <laughs> we gotta, <laughs> no, do, don't do any work. Um, 
So I want to encourage us here today. Are you creatively planning for your family? You know, is there trips that you're hoping to bring your family? You know, it might take a while to save up money, but it's going to be all worth it. Um, there's a shift in my thinking. When I was younger, when I got a paycheck, there was a lot of stuff that I wanted to accumulate, right? That's kind of the natural way things are. But in reality, as you get older, things change where we don't really want things anymore, but we want experiences. And I want to encourage you guys to be able to, um, to create a legacy for the future, to save up whatever you need to do in order to be able to have creative time with your family. And as we consider our workplace, our sports teams, or even clubs, um, this is an area of our life that sometimes we really keep God out of the picture because we don't want to look like that weird Christian person. But I want to encourage us that what if we were to reframe our thinking to look at our work and to see how God may want to use you there. And as we consider this here, um, if you have been working at an organization or a business for at least a couple weeks, months, or even years, we all know that there are glaring problems there. There is, we live in a broken world and sometimes in the workplaces that we're living in, it's broken itself. And sometimes the easiest thing that we do is go in, do the bare minimum and dig out. Or sometimes it's even worse to where we know the problems that are happening at work and we are there perpetuating the irritation that's happening there. We're like, look at all this happening. You know, didn't you see that person? Didn't you see a lot of stuff that they should be doing but they're not? And then we become part of the problem because we're just perpetuating all of this ugly talk and chatter about how bad the company is or how the business is or it's not where you want it to be. And the truth is we don't slip into excellence. You know, it doesn't just happen like, oh wow, we're an excellent company now. And it just happened. That never happens, right? So when we think about your workplace, when we think about our marriages or even all that stuff, we need to know that God has you there for a purpose. And when we uh, partner with God and say, okay, God, you have me here today. Is there anything that you want me to do? I believe that simple prayer can make a world of a difference and change the perspective of where you're at right now. You may not enjoy the work that you're doing, but God may change your heart in doing it. And you might even see a change in the atmosphere of your workplace. So as we come to a close here with this message, what would it look like for you to bring creative solutions to your world? What would it look for you to bring creative solutions to your marriage, in your children's lives? You know, is there a relationship that you know that it is from God and they are worth keeping, but you know that there's a rift there, but you need some way or some form of creativity to be able to reconnect you with that person. I want to encourage us to pray, to seek God. Ask God, you know, is there something that you want me to do? So as we go into this time of worship, you don't have to sing, a worship team will sing, but I want to encourage you guys to ask God those crazy prayer questions. You know, God, is there, if you're married, God, is the marriage that you have me experience now, is it at the right place? God, is there anything you want me to change to see this marriage flourish? And for those of you who are working or single, you're in your work field or profession, I want to ask you to, to talk with God during this time and to ask God, God, is there anything in my workplace um, that you want to see changed? And is there anything you want me to do about it? Even as you dropped in pictures or words of things you want to see change happen in our marriages, our families, our workplaces, wherever you have us. I believe, Lord, that you've risen up faith in your people to believe. So if you're here today and there is a picture or vision that you have that you believe that it is from God, God wants change to happen in your marriage. God wants change to happen in your families, in your workplace, wherever God places you. Can you just simply raise your hand if that's you, that God gave you a picture or something to do or a step to take? Can you please raise your hand? Yeah. All right, that's good. You guys can put your hands down. You know, I really believe that God loves us and He cares for us and He wants to continue to make it clear. Even in this brief moment, of just a minute or so, just quieting ourselves before God. God gives pictures to different ones here. And I want to encourage us uh, here today that God may give you a picture and it's going to cause a whole lot of faith to well up. And 
the truth is, is that God wants that to happen and he needs to bring other people around alongside with you. So I want to pray for you that God is going to give you the faith to step out and to do something about that particular vision or picture. So God, I thank you, Lord, for my friends here today and even myself included, Lord, who have a picture of what we want to see happen with our marriages, with our children, with our families, and even our workplaces and everywhere in between. God, I pray, Lord, that you would give us the faith to act on what it is that you say to us. And I pray, Lord, that we thank you that we are not alone, that the Holy Spirit is with us to give us the strength and even the wisdom and the know-how and the creative solution in order to see things happen. So we acknowledge, Lord, that this vision is not from us, and God is from you. And I pray, Lord, that you give us the strength and the boldness and encouragement to step out. And I thank you, Lord, that you will provide great friendships people around us, other co-workers to come alongside with us, to be able to fulfill the calling and the purpose that you have for us, to see these areas of our lives change. So we thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to continue to do in and through our lives. We trust in you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us at the Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. If you'd like to receive more sermons or content, please subscribe. And if you'd like to give, you can give at gracehonolulu.org. Have an amazing day, and we'll see you next time. God bless.